Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Andrew Thomas. He is a senior lecturer in psychology at Swansea University in the UK. His research is concerned with the differences in mating strategies within and between the sexes. So, Dr. Thomas, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, it's a real pleasure for me, too. Okay, so uh, I would like to start by asking you about the ovulatory shift hypothesis. I mean, this is, it, it seems to be to be somewhat controversial, I mean, in terms of at least some of the changes in behavior in women when they are going through their cycle, because I've already talked on the show with people like Lars Pink, uh, Marty Hazelton, Sarah Hill, and I mean, uh, particularly when it comes to the bit about women uh, having preference for extra pair copulations uh, at a certain point in their cycle, that, that, that seems to me to be the controversial point. People disagree there. But uh, first of all, could you explain what the ovulatory shift hypothesis is really? Yes, it's, it's this idea that uh, women have uh, psychological adaptations that basically you see a change in mating psychology depending on their fertility status. Mm -hmm. So most people are aware that women aren't um, constantly fertile. It varies depending on the, the point in the menstrual cycle that they're in. Yeah. Uh, and presuming that this has been the case for a very, very, very long time, um, there's uh, this, this theory that women have actually evolved to change their mating behavior in line with that fertility window. So when you are very, very fertile, it kind of makes sense to be exceptionally discriminant about the uh, sexual partner that you have, because that's the point in which you're most likely to get pregnant by them, uh, as opposed to the standard discriminant, because people are discriminant all the time about their, uh, their partners, especially women. Um, so, yeah, it's this idea that depending on the fer fertile status of, uh, within the cycle, um, women may be uh, more or less attracted to those who show uh, quote, un quote unquote good, good genes. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Okay, so, uh, and when women are at peak fertility, I mean, when it comes to them uh, wanting extra pair copulations with perhaps males that are higher value than their own partners, I mean, what's your reading of the literature? Do you think that there's good evidence to support that or not? Yeah, well, you said at the start that it's controversial, and it, and I would correct that and say it's very controversial. So I've sat there, in, um, I, I've actually sat there in academic conferences, and some of the people you've just mentioned have had flat-out arguments in front of uh, dozens of people, of which I've I've sat there and gone, wow, okay. Um, so yeah, it really is a hot topic, and some people are saying yes, and some people are saying no, and some people are saying that you're you're measuring it wrong. Uh, I mean, from a theoretical point of view, it, it kind of makes sense. You know, you have um, choosing a partner to have a, a, a child with is a very, very high risk decision for, for a woman to make mm -hmm. in terms of what happens if you get that wrong. So, you know, if you get it right, then that's great. You uh, you hopefully go on to have uh, a, a child with with someone who you may you, you might love them, uh, you might be with them, uh, or if they're not there anymore, at the very least, a child who who has some high quality genes about them. But if you get that wrong, then your reproductive resources are kind of uh, held up in um, in a child that isn't really um, enhancing your fitness in the best part possible way from a Darwinian perspective. So it kind of makes sense. The logic of it makes sense. Whether it actually happens or not is, uh, is still a little, little bit of a question mark there. What I basically did with, with my stuff is I thought, well, I actually have quite a bit of data um, between subjects data. So by that, we mean that we've asked women uh, what their current fertility status is when they've come in the lab to do other experiments. And we've also measured things like sociosexuality. Uh, so I thought, well, this is a big, big um, debate at the moment. Let's contribute to that. And that's why I, I produced a recent paper with um, Ben Jones, Steve Stewart-Williams, and one of my um, uh, former students, Stephanie Armstrong. And we 
even though we had quite a respectable sample there, we weren't able to find that between subjects of effect. Um, now, whether I'm happy to then draw a line under that and say, oh, nothing exists, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant for that. And I'm hesitant for a couple of reasons. So the first one is that we measured something called sociosexuality, which <laughs> isn't actually this measure of do you want to have sex with someone other than your partner? It's do you like having uncommitted sex? So it's not quite getting right to the um, to the core of, uh, of the problem there. And then the second thing, of course, is that between subjects data is, is messy. Uh, there's a lot of noise there. You try and reduce that noise by having lots and lots of people in your data set, but it's not really a, uh, an alternative for the gold standard, which is where you get someone into the lab and you say, uh, what's your current facility status? Okay. You, do you fancy cheating on your partner with this very ruggishly handsome person here? Uh, no? Okay, right, come back in a couple of weeks' time and let's see if you answer differently. You know, tracking someone across the cycle. And when you look at some of those studies, there's been a, quite a few re, uh, released in evolution and human behavior, behavior recently. Uh, they, they're the ones at the moment that reliably keep coming back to uh, say that something's there. Um, the two... I kind of learned something new with every study that I uh, produce. Uh, and the two things that I've really learned from, from the study that I published in evolutionary psychology about this recently, is, the one takeaway for me is that um, if there is something there, then I, I expect that it will be highly context dependent. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a, a, a heterosexual couple and the woman is very much uh, in love with their man and um, uh, attracted and happy and sees him as a good father, then it, it wouldn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective for them to have some sort of adaptation that makes them look for extra pair copulations outside of that. Uh, that would actually be dangerous or, or, or threatening to the current relationship. So I imagine that if there is something there, it's going to be context specific, uh, because if it isn't context specific, uh, I'm very much surprised that even with quite a large data set, you can't detect these um, uh, effects on a, a between subjects basis. Uh, so yeah, so that's really that, that's really the main takeaways from from that study for me. I'm not saying that there's not, nothing there. I'm just saying we didn't find out on a between subjects level, um, and I think that there's probably some uh, contextual variable that needs to be um, captured in order for these effects to reveal themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and that contextual variable would be, in this case, relationship satisfaction or That's something like that. Yeah, it's one of those situations where when I was writing it up, you sort of go, I wish I had recorded that because that would be perfect. <laughs> we had relationship status, so we were able to say, you know, is there something here for those who are single versus those who are currently in a relationship? Uh, because if you found it in singles, but not in those within a relationship that might raise some questions um but it didn't really show up anything so on a in a broad sense we didn't find any evidence but that doesn't rule in out anything if you're looking at specific contexts mm -hmm. so i think it would be fair to say here that when it comes to the specific point of women at peak fertility seeking out extra pair copulations it's still inconclusive I, I would say so, yeah. I mean, if I was a gambling man and you, you asked me to put a bet, I, I, I think that there is something there. Um, I think it's the type of thing where it has, I think it was in folk psychology before this research, you know, came about. Yeah. And when it's estimating, this, this sometimes is a, 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 a grain of truth to folk psychology. It's not always accurate, but there's, there's something. And I would be surprised if um, ultimately we found there was nothing at all. I think that we'll find something that will be quite nuanced. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, perhaps it could also have something to do with personality traits? That perhaps certain women that are more, I don't know, sociosexual would seek for more extra pair of copulations. Yeah, but, and this is the thing, 
it depends on whether you're looking at sociosexuality as a trait or a state. And this came up in my recent article a bit because some people see sociosexuality as uh, a, a personality trait like any other extroversion, neuroticism and stuff. Whereas actually, um, in from my view, it, it's kind of statey as well. Uh, so there are actually some um, studies that show that you can manipulate sociosexuality a little bit through priming and cues. Mm. So, um, I mean, if, if you're act, asking about particular personality factors for, for women who might might do this, I'm not sure sociosexuality is necessarily the right one because we... <sighs> Maybe. I mean, we know in men that sociosexuality is associated with cheating. Um, so it would surprise me if you found women who were in extra pair copulations that they, they didn't have a slightly higher than baseline rate of sociosexuality. So I guess there's something there. But when you're talking about personality, I'm thinking more actually um, about things like Machiavellianism, you know? So oh, thinking okay. About, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about, yeah. Because a lot of the time, at least if you, you know, if you can find anything online, anything you can find online and you can actually find forums online of, of, of women who actually coach each other through the process of having a long-term partner but then having short-term flings that are hidden and, and stuff like that so it's something that uh, people are aware of sometimes and plan sometimes so maybe some of the uh, darker sides of personality come into it there as well yeah, so perhaps something more focused on the dark triad. Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to it would be interesting to consider. I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk a little bit about mate preferences and sex differences. Uh, so I read in your work about the mate preference priority model. Could you explain it? Yeah, so this is uh, something that was born from Norman's Lee, Norman Lee's lab uh, in the early 2000s. And, um, well, I don't think it was his lab at the time, he was with Doug Kenrick, but um, it's the I. For me, the model almost started as a solution to a problem. And the problem is this in mate research, most of the mate preferences that you ask people about are positive, right? So you ask someone, do you want a kind partner? Well, of course I do. Kindness is a great thing. You know, do you want someone who's physically attractive? Yes, generally people consider that positive. So people say, I want more of it. People aren't measuring mate preferences and say, hey, do you want a partner who stinks? Yeah, do you want a partner who's mean? Um, those things don't come up. So what happens if you give someone a survey and say, say, say to them, you know, rate the uh, importance of this thing on a scale of one to 10, people tick nine or 10 for everything. Now, uh, people like David Buss over the years have tried different things like ranking. You know, if you get people to rank those traits and some stuff goes to the top. And when you do that, you actually find that the stuff that appears on the top of the list tends to be stuff that from an evolutionary perspective would be fundamental to reproductive reproduction and reproductive success. And so the mate pre um, preference priority model is kind of born from this idea of, OK, so people want everything. But if you force people's hand and pin them down and say, OK, well, everything's important but what's the most important that you then tend to find that actually people prioritize the traits that are important for, for reproductive success first and foremost before then uh turning to other things and and within that sort of model we have this distinction of sort of necessities uh versus luxuries so necessities are these things where it's like i i need them straight away as much as i can get and then when i'm satisfied there my attention then turns to to the luxuries and you tend to find that um those traits that are necessities are those that, uh, that are things like kindness uh, uh, status or good financial prospects, intelligence and physical attractiveness, all things that we know are very, very important for um, uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. And these differ between men and women, right? There are sex differences when it comes to uh, how they prioritize these traits? Yes, there are. Yeah, it tends to be uh, a matter of degree. So sometimes people read this sort of research and they take away from it. Um, men don't care about a woman's status. Uh, women don't care about a man's attractiveness. 
which just isn't the case. So you do find uh, sort of medium sex differences, quite robust um, medium sex differences. You know, can run a thousand studies and find that pattern every time. But guys like a bit of status in their uh, in their partners, and and women like a bit of physical attractiveness in their long term guys. Um, but yeah, you, you you do find some difference there between them as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. So physical attractiveness tends to be higher for, for women and uh, sorry for men and uh, good financial prospects for women. When uh, when I published that in the uh, published that and the media picked up on it, however, uh, that uh, I was really surprised about because I was expecting a lot of people to approach me and talk about maybe the east versus west thing because in that study we did a, a comparison oh, or okay. the men compared to women thing. Uh, but actually what the media picked up on was the kindness thing. Because what you found was that kindness was the number one trait. Whether the participant was from the East or the West or male or female, that topped the list. And that were, that got the media coverage, which is something that I was expecting the, the physical attractiveness, good financial prospects thing to come up. But no, it was all about the kindness. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. By the way, did you find any significant cross-cultural differences when it comes to how people rank the different traits? Yeah, um, I can't remember. I think the, the ranking was fairly similar. Mm. Um, where the differences were, because what happened with this, what basically happens with this study is the way that we kind of force people's hand and get them to prioritize things is we, we yeah. kind of give a fixed budget and then we get people to, uh, we say, here's a, uh, it's like a, a designing a character in a video game if you've ever played Fallout or anything like that. Here's a budget. You can assign them to different traits. Go, what do you do? And you know, what do people do with a very small budget? That tells us what they're really interested in uh, in the first instance, compared to if they've got a large budget and can make everything high. Um, so what we really found within this study is that some of the traits that we included, we had some evolutionary ones, um, physical attractiveness, kindness, and then we had other ones which are uh, maybe a little bit more um, influenced by culture. So things like uh, the desire for children, because we know that certain cultures have uh, tried to moderate that quite quite a lot, um, the number of children that people can have, uh, and also things like uh, religiosity as well, varies quite a bit by culture. And what we actually found in the East-West thing was that in order to put more points into things like religion, which it wasn't, by comparison, wasn't important in the West at all. It, the Eastern participants had to compromise from elsewhere. So the pattern looked like um, that people in the East cared less about humor, for example, um, because they care, um, but yeah, they cared less about humor. They cared maybe less about physical attractiveness and stuff like that. Um, I don't actually think they do. What I think is that some of the other traits like religiosity and chastity were so important that they had to make compromises elsewhere. Um, so yeah, the broad picture was that the ranking was fairly similar, but some of these more, I think, um, culturally influenced traits, uh, they soaked up a lot of the points from some of our Eastern participants and left the Western ones going, yeah, put everything in physical attractiveness and uh, good financial prospects and stuff like that. Do you know if any of these differences derive from uh, difference, uh, cultural differences in certain domains, like, for example, the individualistic versus collectivistic difference between the West and the East? Or is that something completely unrelated? Well, we didn't have a measure of sort of individualistic and uh, collectivist. I mean, we did have the cultures that we had in that study the Western ones are fairly a religious. So, you know, we had, the, the, we had Australia, we had UK, we had US, Norway. So these are, are quite atheist countries uh, with some Christianity is probably the way to de describe them these days um, or agnostic with some Christianity. Um, yeah. The Eastern countries, I mean, we had like Singapore in there and Malaysia and there's... Um, quite a lot of, of religion in there, but these are also uh, countries where, you know, there, there are more collectivist countries out there than the ones that we had. Yeah. Um, so you could, you could at a push, 
say we've got east and west and one of the key dimensions is probably more individualistic and less uh, individualistic but we didn't precisely measure that so i'd be reluctant to draw any conclusions off that or i think the you're better off looking at the proportion of religion within those countries and the types of religion within those countries to then better understand um why our participants probably put more of a pre or some of our participants put more of a premium on chastity than religiosity so if you were to take uh, Malaysia for example there's a large Muslim population within Malaysia who ha tend to have more of a premium on chastity compared to if you went somewhere like Norway um, and I'm actually I'm actually running a study at the moment uh, with some Norwegian partners on um, the influence of the number of sexual partners someone's had in the past on their attractiveness. Uh, and my Norwegian partners are like, no, Norwegian participants aren't going to get this because they're like, they're like, it doesn't matter how many sexual partners you've had in the past, they're not going to care. That's not going to influence attractiveness. So there's, mm -hmm. there's cultural differences at the level of the traits that we've looked at that I think you're, you're better off looking uh, at in order to explain the, the, the patterns that we found. Mm -hmm. So with this study that you did, or perhaps other similar studies that other people have done, can you say anything about perhaps the universality of how people prioritize these traits? Because, I mean, we have, we have some uh, studies about the traits that people prefer in the opposite sex, some large-scale ones, like, for example, one that comes easily to mind is the one that David Buss did back in the early 90s in 37 different cultures. But do you have something similar for prioritizing traits? Yeah, basically. And what the, I mean, the conclusion from this is, we're never going to have a conclusion, which is like, these are just 100% nature. And it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Culture has no influence whatsoever. You're never going to have that. Culture does have a, uh, an influence. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it will in, in everything, uh, everything about us. For me, the main takeaway from that study was that even though you found differences between the cultures, they were more a matter of degree. So if you take a step back and you look at the forest rather than the trees, you find this reoccurring pattern of kindness is very important in long-term context, physical attractiveness of a partner is very important, uh, good financial prospects, very important, at least uh, um, intelligence as well, but we didn't measure that in the study. And then culture acts to influence those priorities, you know, but they can't extinguish them. Yeah, so you can, in, in our study, for example, by including religion, you know, people went, oh, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to prioritize physical attractiveness a little bit less in order to get some religion in there in my partner. But that wasn't the same as saying, uh, you know, I'm going to get rid of physical. I'm not going to pay no mind to physical attractiveness whatsoever. The other thing, of course, is that you wouldn't find any of these patterns at all if people were just, uh, you know, making random decisions. So a lot of the time people like to think that uh, make preferences are really uh, idiosyncratic, like you've got one person down the road who they all they care about is humor, they don't care about looks, you know, they don't care about someone with a, a, a job, and actually the thing that they care about most of all is whether the person is a vegetarian or not. And, and that doesn't really happen. You find a broad pattern with some variation around it, um, and I think that pattern, uh, you get more variation across culture, but you can still find that pattern quite consistently. Okay, so uh, so now another question. We've already talked about the evolutory shift hypothesis, but are levels of testosterone also associated with uh, mate strategy change in men? Maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Okay. So, <laughs> that's a really short answer to that question. The long answer to that question is that uh, if testosterone does affect mate preferences uh, or relationship preferences mating strategy it's not happening at moderate increases like you'd get with exercise so the, the, the sort of history to this line of my research is that for my phd i did some work on mating uh, strategy change can you get people into the lab record their preferences for long-term short-term relationships and then does that change um if you depending on what you subject them to and subject is a harsh word uh, but there could be 
sex ratio cues, you could do parental cues. Do these things nudge our preferences for mate strategy? And I found what I think is some fairly convincing evidence of that that I published. Um, and so one of the next stages for that for me was, okay, well, can we actually then go behind this a little bit and see, you know, what is the mechanism here? You know, because we know that short-term mating in men, for example, is re uh, related to testosterone levels. So we thought, okay, well, if you get a, a change in testosterone, might we then find a change in mating strategy to accompany that? Because if we do, then that might start getting behind the sort of uh, strategy uh, plasticity mechanisms and, and poking and prodding them and seeing how they work. So um, I uh, ran a study with some sports scientists where we took some uh, sports science students basically and got them to do some exercise some intense exercise of cycle sprints uh, because when you do intense exercise you actually get a, um, a modest increase in testosterone so this is the type that you get if you went down the gym 10% 25% depending on how they hard they worked and so when we did that with a before and after measure of uh, mating strategy, we didn't find any change. So uh, we did take saliva samples and measured the testosterone. They had, a, 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 on average, a 10% um, increase. That's on average. So some of the guys had a two or threefold increase. Some had a decrease because they found the exercise too tough or whatever. Um, but we didn't find any effect of those uh, that increase. Now, that's not to say that testosterone doesn't affect things because there's a lot of uh, studies out there now, uh, very hard to do in the UK for ethical reasons, but types of studies where, you know, they'll get people to spread testosterone gel on their chest to increase testosterone levels by like 13 fold. And when you do that, you do get some uh, interesting changes, even to like cognitive decision making for like problem solving tasks and stuff. Um, and supposedly for uh, mate preferences as well. So if you did that sort of change, then uh, you might find a change to mating strategy, but certainly we can start ruling out stuff at the very low end, uh, akin to what you'd get uh, exercising. And I'm quite happy for that actually, because if uh, a 10% increase in testosterone is all that it needed to uh, move guys more towards a short-term strategy, well, I think our, um, the fabric of our society would look quite different. I think our divorce rate would go from 50% to 99% uh, depending on how often men hit the gym. So it, it, it's not really surprising that a small change doesn't, but where the, the actual tipping point is, and, and if there is one, that's still unknown. So that's my, hence my maybe answer to you. Yeah, I, I hope I'm not mistaken, but isn't it also relevant here when it comes to testosterone and mating strategies to talk about how levels of testosterone vary between unpartnered versus partnered men, I mean men with partners, and then also between men who don't have children versus fathers? Because, I mean, there's also differences there, right? Yes, there is. I mean... Um, these are the types of, um, can, well, they're not really contextual variables, are they? They're person variables that you'd want to include for a larger study. Um, I mean, testosterone studies are part of the problem is they're quite expensive to run. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you're 100% right because what the research shows, not just between subjects, active, ac actually tra tracking people over time, that as, fathers, as men become fathers, as they enter long-term relationships, as they have children, their sort of baseline testosterone drops mm -hmm. I mean what we, we were really looking at here was reactivity so how uh, the change in testosterone over and above the baseline affected uh, things but um, yeah with a larger sample you could start poking and prodding you know baseline effects um, uh, contextual effects fatherhood status things like that as well so yeah if we designed the perfect study together, Ricardo, we would definitely include some of those uh, those variables. Okay, so uh, we've already talked here a little bit about sociosexuality. What is sexual compulsivity? So sexual compulsivity is it's almost you can think of it kind of like a, a preoccupation. So it's a preoccupation with uh, sexual urges, fantasies, behaviors. Um, and that preoccupation makes those sorts of urges uh, a little bit difficult to control. So um, at extreme levels, that can 
you know, negatively impact your your health, your job, your relationships and stuff. Mm. Uh, but sort of at no, normal levels, you can kind of kind of think of it like that urge to to have sex with, with, with people and, and how much that sort of draws your your attention and, and your desires. Um, and that kind of contrasts against uh, social sociosexuality because sociosexuality is just the the desire to have sex without the strings attached. Mm-hmm. So you can see, you can see there's probably a, a nice crossover on the Venn diagram between those things, uh, but they are slightly different constructs. Um, and this is going on to my, uh, my recent research um, combining these two things. Um, the, the important thing from an evolutionary perspective is that sociosexuality is seen as more than just sociosexuality. So um, some people, when they research sociosexuality, they'll just use it as a personality trait, like psychopathy, like neuroticism. And they'll just correlate it with a bunch of things and just call it sociosexuality for sociosexuality's sake. There's a lot of good work there, things like uh, HIV prevalence and uh, STI prevalence, and I, and I understand that. But from an evolutionary point of view, sociosexuality is more. It, it, it speaks about mating strategy. It, mm-hmm. It's a proxy for a suite of evolved psychological mechanisms we have. Yeah? And so... I mean, historically, I've also seen papers where people will put sociosexuality and sexual compulsivity in side by side, treating them the same. Uh, when actually, if you're taking a uh, a mating strategy perspective and saying sociosexuality is more about whether you're engaging in short term or long term mating, well, then there's kind of a place for sexual compulsivity. Um, lying underneath sociosexuality. So like I have a short-term mating strategy Mm -hmm. which affects my mating psychology in various ways, one of which is the drive towards uh, sex. That's that's a more sort of nuanced view than just seeing these two things as aspects of humanity floating around that sometimes bump into one another. Yeah, but uh, I mean, there are sex differences in sociosexuality and sexual compulsivity, or not? Yes, yeah. Um, within sociosexuality, for example, it, 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 specifically in terms of desire, so not necessarily the behavior or whether it's okay, but mm-hmm. the desire to have uh, sex in the absence of a relationship, uh, that's one of the the largest sort of psychological sex differences that you can find and one of the most robust ones as well. Uh, you know, you, you find it time and time again every time every time a study is uh, performed. In fact, with my students now, uh, if we do any research on um, uh, including sociosexuality, I tell them to no longer include hypotheses about whether men will score higher than women on measures of sociosexuality because it's just a boring hypothesis by this point. It's been done so long. And like, there's more novel things to test, you know? Uh, it's good as a, as a maybe a validity check or uh, make sure that your, your data isn't crazy. But other than that, you know, it's, it's a very robust thing. Sexual compulsivity as well. Yeah. Um, and this is, again, anytime you see a robust sex difference like that, especially if it's something that does transcend cu- cultural boundaries, you've got to say, well, is there evolutionary significance in there? Um, and which is kind of what's pushed me down the pathway of uh, some of my more recent studies on uh, problematic sexual behavior like voyeurism. Mm-hmm. Uh, since, you, since you mentioned that, what is the relationship between sociosexuality and behaviors like voyeurism and exhibitionism? Well, there's a positive association, um, and I'm not the first one to find that. That's been known for, for uh, a while. Um, and you also find, like you have a sex difference in um, social sexuality, you have a sex difference in interest uh, towards voyeurism and exhibitionism. So men tend to have a much greater interest in these things, whether they carry them out is, is something different, but they have a much greater interest in these things uh, than, than women do. And so uh, some of the research uh, that I've done recently. So, you know, are, are these things one and the same? You know, if we've got the sex difference in sociosexuality and a sex difference in interest in these particular the particular sexual um, uh, activities or desires, is one driving the other? 
Yeah, right. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if there are studies on that, but perhaps it would be very interesting to study those kinds of behaviors in uh, a subset of women, like, for example, porn stars, because I sometimes hear uh, interviews with them and uh, it's very frequent that you hear them saying that they really love the fact that they are uh, exposing themselves to other people wh while they're doing sex for the camera. So, I mean... Oh, yeah, de definitely. And I mean, most of the time when we're talking about sex differences and stuff, we're kind of assuming uh, normal distributions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got a normal distribution for men, a normal distribution for women, and they kind of overlap a little bit, uh, but they pulled apart a little bit as well, and that's when we're talking about the sex difference. So in this study that I did recently, when we asked people about their interest in voyeurism, you're working with completely different distri distributions. So the overwhelming response to, do you want to peek on a stranger while they're undressing, yeah, or do you want to flash yourself to someone else, no surprise, the overwhelming answer is no. <laughs> but it's not the case that with men you find, you know, uh, a lot of men who say yes or show some interest and all women don't. Uh, what you basically get is pretty much everyone says no. And then you get some men who say mm, maybe and then a smaller number who say, oh, yes, definitely. Um, and it's just those maybe and definitely uh, aspects of the distribution that are much smaller for women. So you, you do have women out there. You find all sorts of weird and wonderful sexual uh, fetishes in men and women too. You just tend to find more of them in men. Yeah. By the way, I would like to take this opportunity to take advantage of the title of a recent Psychology Today post of yours. Uh, will men really sleep with just about anyone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so this is uh this post was kind of inspired by i mean there's there's a really cool part in uh, the start of uh david buss's uh, evolution of desire book i think mm -hmm. it is where uh and this is where i find out it's not and someone like jeffrey miller comes along and kills me um it's in one of those two books where the the observation is you know, overhearing some women in a cafe talking about how you know there's no good men in the city there's no single yeah. men in the city to date and then this really attractive male waiter comes in to serve them and they could just kind of ignore him so it's not that there isn't anyone there isn't anyone by certain criteria and this is kind of like my moment because uh i i happened across someone making this comment of you know oh, all men are pigs and they'll they'll sleep with anything and i thought you know, this isn't this person I heard this off is that they're not on their own. This sort of comes into public perception quite a bit. And so like, what's the root behind that? Um, and I think it's because people don't understand the difference between long term and short term mating mm -hmm. strategy. Um, what P, the conclusions that people draw about what the other sex wants normally makes an assumption of the mating strategy. Um, so men will generally have lower standards for sexual partner generally not exclusively, not always the case, not all men. Um, but by and large, you'll find they'll have lower standards, but only for short-term sexual liaisons. Mm -hmm. And the reason that, this, that uh, this comes into public con consciousness is that women don't do that because sexual liaisons for women are far more risky uh, from a reproductive yeah. perspective than, in, than it is for men. Um, and so women actually, if anything, they tend to be even pickier about the short-term partners they'll have than their long-term partners. Um, whereas men tend to lower their standards because they've got a lot to gain in terms of reproductive uh, success and not a lot to lose. Um, so yeah, that kind of inspired the article. And it was a bit of a, uh, like maybe a Buzzfeed attention capturing uh, start title uh, but hopefully the lesson by the end is well you know if every way that you go um, men look like they'll sleep with anything um, and you're serious about having a long-term relationship then maybe think about where you're going is that a maybe a hotbed for men who are playing a, a short-term mating strategy game yeah I, I mean I asked you about that because I just saw the post yesterday and I find <laughs> and I found the title really funny I mean I, I was uh, I was aware of what would be the answer to the to the question <laughs> but I just found it funny so uh, okay so I, I mean when it comes to evolutionary psychology and studying the evolutionary slash biological basis of sex differences I mean, 
what is your position when it comes to distinguishing between uh, two different entities, in this case, sex and gender? Do you think that that's a useful approach to have or not? It's a bit of a hot potato, if I'm honest. So it depends very much on the nature of the question that you're asking. I mean, the, the reason it's such a hot potato is because gender is very important to, uh, to some people, a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, they sure. uh, start talking about gender. People have ownership for the gender that they identify with and they, they will defend that quite strongly. And so it's, it's always a bit difficult to have a, um, a sex versus gender, especially if you're talking about usefulness uh, in a kind of detached clinical way, if you've got people who are very emotionally invested in those, in those terms. My view is that it's a bit problematic to look at things from a gender perspective for me because I'm an evolutionary psychologist and the sort of theories that I have in my toolkit tend to be derived from evolutionary biology. Now, humans are just one mammal and just one animal among many, and evolutionary biological theories, by and large, are designed not just with humans in mind. And so when you have a lot of these theories, they talk about sex because, you know, you don't have, to, to the best of my knowledge, you know, if you uh, take any other mammal, they're certainly not able to communicate to you whether they have any gender identity. So a lot of the theories that we use are grounded in sex. Uh, and so right from the from the outset, uh, you, we're, we're kind of built up in such a way where, where sex is going to be uh, more of a useful concept to ask about than gender is. I'm not saying that uh, it, it isn't and that in the future it may turn out not to be. It's just historically up until now it's kind of geared that way. Um, the other thing that's kind of getting in the way a little bit from, uh, from my perspective is that um, it's hard to make generalizations about people of different genders. Uh, so for example, uh, in a lot of my recent research over the past couple of years, I've asked people right from the off in their demographic form, what is your, your sort of biological sex? What is the gender that you identify as? And for a myriad of reasons, so call it social des desirability, self-selection to questionnaires, whatever, 99% of the time, I end up with people saying my biological sex is a man and my gender identity is a man. And it's only a very small number of people who deviate from the sort of standard, that sort of standard pattern. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to say, hello, participant number 272. I know there's only one of you in my data set, uh, but I now want you to represent a large group of people in a way that I can generalize things. It's not very fair. So of course, what tends to happen is these sort of, uh, the, these people in these data sets, you can't take much from them. They get shelved and put in another data set uh, or just included on the basis of their biological sex. So we're really, I think the worst thing that you can do is make assumptions uh, about people. I tend to try and err on the side of caution. So my approach is that I'll keep asking about sex and gender until I have enough data to be able to see whether gender is useful. Um, in, uh, uh, useful in a way of explaining things within evolutionary theory, but at the moment kind of the jury's out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, another topic in the domain of evolutionary psychology. So there's this paper you wrote with Steve Stewart Williams where you differentiate between the males compete, females choose model of sexual selection and uh, what you call the mutual mate choice. So uh, could you explain what's the difference there and why do you think it's important to establish it? Yeah, so, so this seems to be a little bit of a recurring theme from for us from earlier on in the interview. We keep coming back to this sort of uh, black and white versus more nuanced thinking. Yeah. Um, so the, the paper that I did with, uh, with Steve a few years ago now, um, that was kind of designed to uh, undo a little bit of black and white thinking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have some animals in uh, the animal kingdom who basically the the guys do all of the competing and the women do the choosing well not the women sorry the females do the choosing um and that's that yeah so uh peacocks would be a, a fantastic example of that the males spend all of their time and pour all of their effort into attracting the women 
ugh, I keep saying women, sorry, the females. Um, and the females just have to, to, to choose the, the peacock. Um, and these sorts of species are often used when talking about these evolutionary biological theories uh, because they're quite intuitive and it's easy to kind of get your head around that. The problem is humans like that uh, aren't like that as a species. So we aren't just in a position where it's uh, men who I can say men and women appropriately now and not confusing with my males and females. Um, we're not in a position where men go out and compete and then they're not selective at all over women. Uh, and it's just women go out there and choose the guys and don't have to care what the guys think about them. That, that's, that's not us. We're a pair bonded species and men care a lot about the women they choose and are quite picky and women choose very picky about men as well. You know, if they weren't, you'd see all sorts of weird and wonderful things in society. You'd see uh, women going to nightclubs without makeup on in their comfortable pajamas um you know not even having showered because why bother because i'm just going to go and choose no one's going to choose me right yeah. uh, and you'd similarly probably i mean you have some guys who work themselves to death to increase their status and stuff anyway but you know true um males compete females choose human society i think that would be kicked up uh, to an un unimaginable notch um where i think what doesn't really help with the perception of um men doing the competing women choosing is again this sort of long-term short-term mating dichotomy because if you look at things from a short-term perspective yes it is a lot more like that for short-term uh, partners uh, the standards drop for men the pickiness goes up for women not exclusively the case you know there will be women out there who in a short-term context have very low standards there's just not that many of them um, so our sort of antidote to this was to design a paper that talks a bit more about an alternative model. So instead of a make, make males compete, females choose model, we have a mutual mate choice model, which recognizes the fact that even once you take into account sex differences, we're a species where we both invest heavily in long-term relationships and we're both choosing um, uh, sex, we're, we're both choosy animals, uh, both men and women. Um, so yeah, so that was the the the, uh, the MCFC versus the MMC. So males compete, females choose versus the male, uh, the mutual male choice models. And for those of you who are thinking, well, what animals should I compare humans to rather than peacocks? I always say gibbons. Gibbons are a, a better example, I think. You know, you get a very similar difference between men and women, uh, between fe males and females in terms of body mass. They're both protective of one another. Um, up near me here, there's a, a gibbon, a, a chimp sanctuary, and they've got a couple of gibbons. And the males and female uh, t together, they sing all the time. And when you read into it, you realize that gibbon, male gibbons sing to keep away other males from their female, and female gibbons sing to keep away other females from their male. And it's it's more of a, a fitting analogy, I think, to humans than something like a bit more extreme, like a gorilla or an elephant seal. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but I mean, you, you wrote this paper uh, and you say that the MMC model is better suited to wim uh, to humans. Uh, but do you think that perhaps evolutionary psychologists have been focusing too much on the other model, the MCFC model? Or not? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to so at the moment, I'm doing a lot of reading around the relationship satisfaction literature. Mm -hmm. mainly heterosexual and what you tend to find is there's not a huge amount of sex differences in relationship satisfaction um there's some there they're small but they're, they're nowhere near and it, the reason i'm telling you this is it kind of it makes me th maybe have a bit more of an appreciation for why uh evolutionary psychologists might exaggerate it is because within the short-term domains mm -hmm. that tends to be where the sex differences lie you know, people are probably not reporting a lot about non-sex differences in long-term relationships because they're kind of boring. They're not sexy, right? The sexy stuff are the se is the sex differences. So you see all of these publications about sex differences that tend to be attached to, to domains relevant for short-term mating. Um, and the more you read about them, the more you have a sort of availability bias and so it, it, it goes on from, from there. And the, and the other thing, of course, is that sometimes when you talk about these things, 
you can talk about them in a nuanced way that's complex and difficult and requires some thought, or you can talk about them in a simplified way that's easy to do but skips the nuance. And I think you get a little bit of, of that as well. Um, my concern is not necessarily with evolutionary psychologists, because when you talk to evolutionary psychologists, if they make some sort of comment that polarizes the sexes a little bit, the moment you pin them down, they go, oh yeah, well actually I know is more nuanced than that and overlapping distributions and stuff. My concern is, is how the public then pick up on it and, and mm -hmm. how they per perhaps polarize it. Um, Recently, for example, I've been doing a lot of peer reviews of uh, sex differences work in mating. And I'm starting to find this pattern. And we talked about this a little bit in the article, but it's, a, it's something that hasn't changed. You tend to get um, some research where people will go, right, OK, we think that um, uh, a harsh childhood will affect the short term mating preferences of women. So we, we will go and do a study just on women to see whether we can find an association between child harshness and uh, mating preferences now. And I'll say, we found that. Here's an interesting aspect of female psychology. But you don't know if it's an aspect of female psychology because there's no control group. And the ultimate control group for women is, is men. You know, if you exclude the men, you don't know whether you're making generalizations about w female psychology or human psychology. Um, and I think sometimes people are, are reading these things and saying, oh, that, that just applies to women, therefore it doesn't apply to men, and that can polarise views of, uh, of sex differences in, in the public. So that, that's something I'm a little bit worried about. But I don't think it's necessarily intentional, uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, when you mentioned that perhaps the general public would tend to interpret things incorrectly and perhaps some groups out there would even weaponize this sort of research. I mean, yeah, you get some of that, particularly on the internet, coming from uh, male-centered groups, like, for example, uh, incels or even groups related to male wellness or male improvement or something like that, because they have a very, very biased reading of the literature, and they say that men and women have this strict sex differences and mate preferences and there's virtually no overlap at all and i mean and and men have to be like these and women like that otherwise they won't mate with each other and stuff like it like that which is very very unhelpful and stupid mm -hmm. And I think you've got uh, Will Costello coming on with you in a few weeks' time. He's hopefully coming to do a PhD in, in that with the incel community. Uh, he's hoping to do a PhD with me in uh, the coming year, I think. My, my view on that is, yeah, you're 100% right. These groups sort of have taken on board some of the, the key findings of evolutionary psychology and maybe polarized them a little bit. And, uh, well, not a little bit, a lot uh, for, right. for some of them. The thing about that group, especially in the media at the moment, um, incels are having a, a particularly hard time because the, the public is obviously very much aware of the harm that uh, a small number of people who some of them have identified that community and some of them haven't have then done to other people but i actually think that where the the real harm of mm, polarizing evolutionary findings for the incel community the real harm is actually to themselves because um by having some black and white thinking around some of these evolutionary findings and not having the nuance there, it can leave them really giving themselves a hard time. Yeah. Feelings of, of worthlessness, low status, hopelessness, fear, anger, bitterness. You know, for the vast majority of people in that category, the, the, the pain is to themselves, not to other people by their hands. And so... Mm -hmm. Where I'm hoping in the future to do some research that maybe helps correct things a little bit and because some of the things that uh, some of the uh, the findings that this incel community have latched onto the findings themselves have a basis in uh, a grounding in science but the interpretation mm -hmm. of it is 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 wrong and uh, an extreme and I think that we, we could really help these people by talking to them about that and maybe uh, correcting that a little bit.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and perhaps in their case, the, by doing an extreme reading of this science, they even put themselves in a situation where they themselves are throwing opportunities out the window just because they think that if they don't have those physical and psychological traits that they think are ideal for women, then they don't have any chance in the mating market, which is yeah. completely untrue. And I'm sure that that'll apply to some people. There may be some of those out there who, you know, they they feel that they can't compete in the mating market and they genuinely can't. That might well be a reality. Um, And if that's the case, you know, you can still do something about how you cope with things and how you feel Mm -hmm. about things. Um, And what we know from countless, you know, hours of psychotherapy, with uh, you know uh, perspectives coming from a cognitive behavioral um, uh, stance, that any form of extreme thinking is generally not leading you to a good place. So yeah, you're right. For some, it could be missing out or, or uh, you know taking themselves out of the the running in the meeting market, thinking they can't compete. But then you've also got some others who are like, well, mm-hmm. they think that not competing is the worst thing in the world and means that they can't have a meaningful life or that they aren't important as a person. Right. And I don't think that that's true. And I think that if you could correct that, regardless, you know, that there are some people out there who are putting their worth as a person entirely attached to their mating outcomes. And that is problematic, I think. Yeah, also because in this context, of course, we're here talking about evolutionary psychology and it's my favorite scientific discipline. I interview lots of evolutionary psychologists on the show, of course, but I mean, there's more things in life than mating and reproducing and things like that. It's not because... uh, is, uh, natural selection is focused mostly on that, that that's the end all and be all of human existence. Precisely. And I mean, I'm reading, uh, rereading Randy Ness's uh, Good Good Reasons for Bad Feelings at the moment. Um, you know, and there's, there's, a, there's a line there about, you know, a lot of your reactions to things are for your genes, not for you. <laughs> Yeah. So you may react to uh, rejection or infidelity from a partner quite extremely because, yeah, that's that you, you know, a, a behavior that has worked for your genes for a long time, but you're not your genes. And if you don't want to feel jealous and you don't want to feel absolute like your life is over about something, you don't have to. Your happiness and the happiness of your genome are different things. And maybe uh, applying that sort of approach to, um, you know, some of these communities of, of men who feel, you know, that they're, they're not able to compete in the mating market might, might help some people. Yeah. So I, will, I guess I will leave the rest for my interview with Will Costello. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he gives a better interview than I do. So. Uh. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's just talk a little bit about one last topic, because you also did work and do on cyber psychology, and I think this is very interesting. So you did, for example, a study where you asked women to create avatars for themselves in the game Second Life. So could you tell us about that? I mean, what was the objective of the study and the results you got there and so on? Yeah, so this this is going uh, quite far back now. This is actually a study I did as part of my bachelor's degree of all things. Um, (laughs) And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, mm, how was it? What's the right word? It wasn't maybe mainstream psychology born from theories that uh, I'd read and gone, oh, this would be a nice follow-on study. It was born more from observation um, that I'd seen. I used to play a lot of World of Warcraft at the time. uh, And I'd noticed, you know, among some of my friends, some of the, uh, you know, when they played other games as well as as, um, World of Warcraft, you know, people were being really careful about... um, the, uh, how they displayed themselves online. So if they had to design an avatar for something, they take a lot of time to do that. Um, but I also noticed in like World of Warcraft as well that um, you know if you had men who picked female avatars were treated differently. You know if people knew that you were a, a, thought you were a woman, 
then you would be treated more nicely and given stuff and stuff until it came out that you were a man. So people, there was stuff going on here with the avatars. And I was there thinking, okay, well, is the thing that's going on with the avatars, at least in part, people making avatars that they would like themselves to be? And that particular insight actually came because I was designing an avatar um, for a game called City of Heroes at the time. And I had a long ginger ponytail, and no surprise, the avatar I made had a long ginger ponytail. But I tell you what, he also had 10% body fat and looked like Hulk Hogan. Um, and I thought, mm, you know, and that was a little bit of self-reflection there. So I thought, oh, maybe it's not just me. Let's do a little bit of uh, testing here. And, you know, there is a rich literature on things like impress uh, impression management that goes back into the business world long before taking things online. It shows that people like to put the, their, their best step forward, and uh, they try to... Um, uh, paint themselves out to be someone who they would would like to be as well as someone that other people would like them to be. So what we basically did in this study is we took people who hadn't played Second Life before, explained to them what it was, huge online environment, other people can see you, and then we got them to design an avatar. Um, and they spent like half an hour doing this, they're changing all the variables. And then uh, we went, right, that's fine, save that. Right, I'm going to get you to do another one now. I want you to design exactly you in this game, exactly how you look. Um, warts and all and then we basically found a way to say okay what were the differences between these two avatars and we focused on uh, weight in this case body weight so uh, what was the difference in body weight and we compared that to an earlier questionnaire the participants did where we asked them you know do you want to increase your weight or do you want to decrease your weight and we found a nice correlation there so so women who wanted to put weight on would design an avatar that was bigger when they were not prompted uh, compared to the avatar they were designed when we, we said design yourself basically and the other way around if they wanted to lose weight they would do something a bit slimmer um, so yeah so that was really uh, interesting the idea that unprompted people were doing something more in line with what they like would like themselves to be than what they actually are so uh, let me just ask you a, a general question about that study and cyber psychology in general. So to what extent are the results you get in those types of studies translatable to non-virtual life and non-virtual behavior? And I mean, what do you get from those studies that perhaps you wouldn't get by doing studies with people in the non-virtual context? Yeah, so, I mean, for this particular study, if you wanted to do something like this in a non-virtual context, I suppose you could, um, you know, get someone to draw something or, or something like that. I mean, I guess the... Uh, the benefit of doing it virtually in this case was that we had a computer program that made it easy for people to customize. Plus, it's also, you know, something that is pretty standard if you're going to engage in that game. So it didn't get people thinking a bit, you know, overthinking as to precisely why we were getting them to design an avatar and stuff like that. So um, you could do that sort of thing offline. I mean, as part of your wider question, do these sorts of things apply to the offline domain? Again, I'm going to give you my favorite response, which is a big fat maybe. Um, I mean, we know that there's a lot of work that you can do virtually that does affect you in similar ways as if you were doing something in reality. Okay, so let's take a let's take a wild example. Let's take pornography, for example. Okay. I, well, not I, <laughs> but if I, if I, <laughs> when you, Ricardo, look at your pornography, or money kidding, um, you know, when someone looks at pornography, they tend to become aroused by it. Yeah? yeah. So they will have a sort of in person response to something, even though it's flat on the screen and not real. What they don't then do is respond to it in certain ways that would only be appropriate if you had something in front of you. So it does tap into things. If it didn't tap into um, our uh, social psychology in some way, then uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't react to these things in, uh, mm -hmm. in similar ways. Another good example would be uh, with things like social exclusion. So I'm not sure if you've heard of some of the uh, studies, they, the, the cyberball studies. Have you heard of the cyberball studies? Mm, I don't think so. No. no? So real simple setup. Uh, you'll have a participant sitting in front of a computer screen 
and uh, they'll be watching two avatars throw a ball back to one another. And the avatars can throw the ball to the participant if they want to. So it's like a three-way throwing game thing. Um, and even though this is quoted by the authors as being one of the most boring tasks ever, if you set it up that these two avatars just throw balls back and forth and don't include the participant, uh, you can actually see one of the areas of the brain that's associated with pain. Uh, so that's the anterior cingulate cortex that will light up. So people will feel social discomfort and social pain the same, you know, in the same way as real in life one, just by something flat on a screen that represents that. So there are pathways from the sort of virtual world into where we are now that makes me feel like these things are somewhat relevant. Yeah, uh, I mean, just before we go, perhaps I would just leave a short comment on that because uh, over the past few months, I've been talking with a lot of people who do work on, commun on online communication, fake news, misinformation, politics, and so on. And I even recently dropped the term uh, in real life because, I mean, they tell me that doesn't really make sense. It's still real life, but just in another context. So just to put that out there. Yes, definitely. I mean, the other thing is you could have a big, weird and wonderful conversation about the disin disinhibition effect as well. You know, whether that exaggerates or takes things in a different direction. Some of the people and this well, feeds in a little bit into some of the incel stuff we were talking about earlier. When someone makes a, a nasty anonymous comment online, how much of that is genuinely felt and believed by the person, how much of it is for effect. Yeah. Similarly, you know, you design an avatar, how much of that is because, you know, you actually want to have three dragons' heads on the back of your shield, or how much of it is just for for an artistic effect. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of deeper conversations to be had there. And I think that's one of the reasons why for that research I focused on, on something specific. There was also like a real world trait as well uh, that, that, that a lot of people think about. Yeah. OK, so uh, I, I know that we're reaching our time limit. So where can people find you on the Internet? They can find me on the Internet, not in Second Life, because I don't play <laughs> Or World of Warcraft, but they can find me on Twitter um, at Dr. Thomas A. G. But also, I've started this new blog, right? The My Darwin Does Dating blog. So if you go to at uh, Dating Darwin, I think it is, you'll get my uh, Twitter account for that. And I've recently started a monthly blog post on Psychology Today called Darwin Does Dating, uh, where we talk about all sorts of weird and wonderful things. You picked up on one of my blog posts earlier, um, but we got stuff coming out every month for, for that. I think the next one I'm going to post is the um, top five things you didn't know about uncommitted sex. So that might be uh, of interest to your viewers. So yeah, you can find me on those, uh, on those two things. Okay, great. So it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. I would like to ask you to please consider supporting the show. You will have links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, and Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Forrest Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hamel, 
David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adan Aruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafini, Akian Gilligan, Sérgio Codrian, uh, Luís Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Jason Party. Thank you for all.